future Democrats. Whoa! It feels so good to be back in New Hampshire. You know, I wanted to be here tonight largely to say thank you. Um, I never thought I would get into politics, not in a million years. But when I got into this fight, I quickly learned that nobody does it alone. So I wanted to start by taking a few minutes to say thank you to some of the hardest working Democrats in the country. Your terrific United States Senators, Gene Shaheen and Maggie Hassan, could not do this without you. These are two women that I have had the honor of traveling with across this great state, fighting shoulder to shoulder to make change. They are truly remarkable women, and we are blessed to have them in the Senate. So thank you both. Thank you. I also want to say to my friends, Congresswoman Annie Custer and Congressman Chris Pappas, it's so good to be with you today, and so good to be in Washington with both of you. You make a big difference. And I want to acknowledge tonight's distinguished honorees, recipients of the McIntyre Shaheen Legacy Award and the Dunphy and Canteras Award, Molly Kelly and Jim Versuchin. Thank you for all of your courage and commitment. So I am also excited to be here tonight with fearless fighters like the leader of the New Hampshire Democratic Party, Chairman Ray Buckley. He is the best. And I'm also deeply grateful for the warm welcome of our host mayor, Mayor Joyce Craig, who has given us this evening. So thank you. All right. And I'm also here this evening to say thank you for your hard work and to celebrate all of your wins. But I'm also here because our country faces a moment of crisis. And New Hampshire Democrats are going to help decide where we go from here. It's going to be up to you guys. So for me, this fight is personal. I grew up out in Oklahoma on the ragged edge of the middle class in one of those paycheck to paycheck families. Now, when I was growing up, my daddy held a lot of jobs. He sold fencing, carpets, housewares, paint. He ended up as a janitor. I have three older brothers. Uh, I was what you call the late-in-life baby. Uh, my mother used to refer to me as the surprise. Uh, you know, all three of my brothers joined the military. My oldest brother was career military, flew 288 combat missions in Vietnam. Uh, we were very lucky to get him back. Um, my brother John, yep. My brother John was stationed in Morocco. My brother David trained as a combat medic. Now, my brothers found their ticket to the middle class through the military. Me, my lifelong dream was to become a public school teacher. But to teach, you need a college diploma. And to get a college diploma, you need money to pay for college. There was no money. The rest of my story has a lot of twists and turns falling in love at 19, <laughs> dropping out of school, um, getting married, finding a commuter college that costs $50 a, me a semester. But I made it. I became a public school teacher. Can we hear it for America's public school teachers? So my first teaching position was as a special needs teacher. There we go. I loved that job. But by the end of the first school year, I was quite visibly pregnant. And the principal didn't invite me back for the next school year. So I found myself at home with a baby. And yep, those were the days. Um, and I got this idea that I could go to law school. So I headed off to a state law school, cost $450 a semester, with a little one on my hip. But first, I needed childcare. So as I'm about to head to law school, my daughter Amelia 
is almost two. And in order to do this, I got to find daycare. But how hard could that be? Uh, well, I found out just how hard it was. I spent weeks visiting all kinds of places, and none of them were right. The kids looked miserable, there was a funny smell, the waiting list was a mile long, the cost was way outside our budget. So finally, it's getting down to like the last week before law school classes are gonna start. I'm starting to sweat, and then I find a truly great place. Cheerful teacher, nice play area, nothing smelled funny. There was only one problem. They only took children who were dependably potty trained. <laughs> Amelia was not quite two years old, but I couldn't let that stop me now. <laughs> I had about five days to get my toddler dependably potty trained. I just want you to know I stand here today courtesy of three bags of M&Ms and a very cooperative toddler. So <laughs> that's why I'm here. But here's the thing, child care never stopped being an issue. For me, like for so many working parents today, it was this weight I had to carry around every single day, and it never let up. Now, eventually I graduated from law school, hugely pregnant with baby number two. You may detect a pattern here. Um, <laughs> And then I got this teaching job at a law school in Houston, and I was beyond excited. Tenure track, I love teaching. And I knew that this teaching was what I was meant to do. So I did whatever it took to make it work. I taught Sunday school, I made cookies for the bake sale, I got dinner on the table every night. Even if most nights it was late, the kids were cranky, and we ate a lot of stuff about just add water out of the box. A lot of you in this room know this story. Washing dishes, bathing children, doing laundry at 11 o'clock at night, and then starting to prepare for the next day. Falling into bed sometime in the early hours of the morning. It was hard, but I could do hard. It was exhausting, but I could do exhausting. But the thing that eventually sank me, childcare. In the space of a few months, I tried everything. A babysitter, a daycare center, another daycare center, a neighbor. One day, I picked up my son, Alex, from daycare. He'd been left in soggy diapers for heaven only knows how long. I was upset with the daycare people, but more than anything else, I was upset with myself. I was angry with myself. I was failing my baby. And so one night, after I put both kids to bed, my 78-year-old Aunt B called long distance from Oklahoma just to see how I was doing. And I said, fine, in that kind of thin, thready voice. And then it was over. I just started to cry. I couldn't hold it together any longer. I blurted it out. I told my Aunt B that I was going to quit my job. I hadn't thought about it, but it just all crashed down, and the words just fell out of my mouth. I cried, I sobbed, I loved that job, but that was it. And finally, I blew my nose, I got a drink of water, and then Aunt B said 11 words that changed my life forever. I can't get there tomorrow, but I can come on Thursday. Two days later, she arrived at the airport with seven suitcases and a Pekingese named Buddy, and she stayed for 16 years. <laughs> but here's the thing about that story. Without childcare, I was a goner. Today, I am a United States Senator. 
in part, but in part, because my Aunt B rescued me on a Thursday about a zillion years ago. So, I tell you that story because I want you to know the story that's a part of my heart forever. It tells a basic truth. Nobody makes it on their own. Nobody. And without childcare, millions and millions of American families simply won't make it. Now look, if every mom in the country had an Aunt B, we'd all be cool. But think about that. I stand here today as someone who eventually wrote 11 books, got tenure at Harvard, built a consumer agency, and beat a damned Republican incumbent to take a seat in the United States Senate. Woohoo! And yet, and yet, child care, child care nearly knocked me out. Child care, or the lack of child care, nearly sent me packing twice. Now, could I have gotten back in the game later, after Amelia and Alex were old enough to go to school, or maybe once they hit high school? Maybe, but maybe not. And today, parents are getting crushed. Right now, in more than half the states in America, one year of child care costs more than a year of in-state tuition at a public university. Here in New Hampshire, care for an infant costs nearly $12,000 a year. Try working a budget around that, and then try it with two kids or with three. It just doesn't work. We are failing mamas and daddies all across this country, and we are failing our kids as well. We know from study after study that providing quality early learning education is one of the single most valuable things we can do to set our children up for success. Yes. But high costs mean that millions of kids can't get access to the care they need or the early educational opportunities that are so critical to their development. And let's not kid ourselves about this. More often than not, it's women whose career opportunities are limited when childcare is hard to find. It's women who get pushed out of the workforce when they don't want to be. And that is just wrong. We are the richest country in the history of the planet. Access to high quality care and education during the first five years of a child's life should not be a privilege reserved for the rich. Child care should be a right for every child in America. And so that's why this week I put out a proposal for big structural change, universal child care and early education. It would provide high quality care and education for free to millions of families and at low cost for everyone else. Now, I'm in New Hampshire, you guys know me, this is not just a vague idea. It's a detailed plan, so let's just get wonky for a minute here. <laughs> you can do this, right? You guys are ready for it. Okay. So here's how universal child care would work. For starters, 
We'd expand our network of locally licensed child care centers, preschool centers, and in-home child care options. Federal government currently provides child care for all military families, and we have 900,000 kids in top-notch Head Start programs. So basically, my proposal is about building out so that every family has access and keeping it affordable for every family. <laughs> Local communities would be in charge but providers would be held to high national standards to make sure that wherever you live in America, your child will have access to quality care and to early learning. And one other part of this, child care and preschool workers will be doing the educational work that other teachers do, so we're gonna pay them like public school teachers. So under this proposal, millions of families could send their kids for free, and the cost would be capped at 7% of income for all other families. Everybody can do this. So look, every Democrat who runs for public office claims to be on the side of working people. That's true running for president, and it's true running for school board. But here's the deal. Pretty much every Republican claims the same thing. And while people in this room might give a huge eyeball roll when Republicans say it, Democrats should notice that a lot of America believed them and didn't believe us. So here's my offer to you. Let's make a commitment, loud and long, for something that Democrats will do for every working family in America. Let's make it clear, let's make it concrete, let's embrace it and show how, if we have the chance, we can make government work for hard-working families. Let's embrace universal child care and early education, and let's show families the difference it will make in their lives. Right here, right here in New Hampshire, the typical family with two young children pays on average a whopping $21,000 a year for child care. Under my plan, that same family right here in New Hampshire would pay a maximum of about $6,000. Think about that. Think about what that would mean. That family would have another $1,200 a month to spend on housing, to pay down loans, to put in savings, to do what they want to do with the money. And for a family of four making under $50,000 here in New Hampshire, the program would be entirely free. And we could just keep pushing the point home. For a single mom working two jobs and pulling in $30,000, her childcare costs would drop to zero. Or for the young couple trying to start a small business, or the young family where one parent is still in school. Think of all the families who would have real money in their pockets and first-rate care for their children. And we can do it without raising taxes one thin dime for working families. <laughs> Let me show you how. The ultra-millionaire tax that I've been talking about, oh yeah. It requires families with a net worth above $50 million to pay a 2% tax on just that part above $50 million. Understand, 
That one change, one change in our tax laws would bring in all the money we would need to completely cover the cost of universal child care and early education plan and still have a couple of trillion dollars left over. This is what it means to be a Democrat. <laughs> Think about that. Asking the 75,000 wealthiest families in this country to pay a little more would cover the cost of providing affordable, high-quality child care and early education options to every child in our country. And to everyone who says, oh, it's just too hard, here's what I know for sure. It's not easy to make big changes, but you don't get what you don't fight for. And I'm in this fight for working families. Because working families in this country are getting crushed. And it's been that way for a long time. I've spent most of my life studying how America's middle class has been hollowed out. I've studied families caught in the squeeze, families that go broke. And what I found is that year after year, the path to economic security has gotten tougher and rockier for working families, and even tougher and even rockier for people of color. And this wasn't an accident. It started quietly. Some of the richest and most powerful people in this country were rich, really rich. But they wanted to be even richer, regardless of who got hurt. So every year, bit by bit, they lobbied Washington and they paid off politicians to tilt the system just a little bit more in their direction. And that is how today, in the richest country in the history of the world, tens of millions of people are struggling just to get by. And that is how, when a working family here in New Hampshire is paying a quarter of their income to cover child care, a Republican-controlled Congress decided it was more important to pass a trillion-dollar giveaway to the wealthiest and people and giant corporations instead of helping that family. Well, I am in this fight because I want a government that doesn't just work for the billionaires and giant corporations. I want a government that works for little families trying to make it from paycheck to paycheck. The squeeze on working families is real. Since the early 1970s, adjusted for inflation, wages in America have barely budged. But the cost of housing has shot up nearly two-thirds. The cost of college has more than tripled. And 40 percent, 40 percent of Americans couldn't find $400 to cover an emergency. Yeah. The middle class squeeze is real, and millions of families can barely breathe. When government works only for the wealthy and the well-connected, and when it abandons anyone who isn't a big campaign donor or can't hire an army of lobbyists, that is corruption, plain and simple, and it's time to fight back. The impact of a government
that year after year has worked for the rich and left little families behind has spread throughout America. And for communities of color that have lived with the impact of structural racism generation after generation, the disaster has hit even harder. Think about this. For every $100 of wealth that the average white family owns in America today, the average black family has $5. Race matters, and we need to say so. And we can't be blind to the fact that the rules in our country have been rigged against other people for a long time. Women, people with disabilities, LGBTQ Americans, Latinos, Native Americans, immigrants, rigged against people, and we need to call it out for what it is. The rich and powerful have rigged our political system. Look at any major issue in America and you can see the impact. Whatever it is that brought you here tonight, that causes you to volunteer, that gets you in the game, whatever moves you deeply, I guarantee that somewhere right at the center lies decisions that are made in Washington that are corrupted by money. <laughs> Gun violence, student loan debt, the skyrocketing cost of prescription drugs, the crushing cost of health care, a broken criminal justice system, drugs and overdoses, oil companies that have more say at the EPA than the millions of people who see with their own eyes the destruction of climate change that is coming our way. Money affects nearly every decision in Washington, and I am in this race to fight back. Now, out on the campaign trail, I talk a lot about changing the rules so that our government, our economy, and our democracy work for everyone. And I want to be crystal clear about exactly what I mean when I say that. We need to change the rules to clean up Washington, to end the corruption in Washington. We need to change the rules to put more economic power in the hands of the American people, in workers, in unions, in small businesses. And we need to change the rules to strengthen our democracy. And that starts with a constitutional amendment to protect the right of every American citizen to vote and to get that vote counted. So I got a lot of details and a lot of ways that we will make structural change in Washington, in our economy, and in our democracy. But I wanted to use tonight to talk about universal child care. Because whether you have small children or not, we all have an interest in the future of this country. And that means we all have an interest in investing in America's children. Until we decide, until all of us decide, men and women, married and single, black and white, old and young, that we are willing to invest more in our children, then we cannot build a country in which women have equal opportunity.
Oh, and by the way, that means electing more women, putting more women in positions of power. Oh, yeah. of that electing more women, putting more women in positions of power, from committee rooms to boardrooms to that really nice oval-shaped room at 1600 Pennsylvania <laughs> Avenue. It's time. You know, last week, um, I was in Nevada, and a woman came up to me uh, afterwards. We were taking pictures, and she came up because she wanted to tell me how now, in her 60s, she was about to graduate from college. And she explained that her first baby had meant that she had put her education aside, and then one thing after another, and only now was she back in school and about to graduate into the world and to tackle her lifelong dream of social work. Education, a more demanding job, a promotion, starting a business. How many women of my generation were sidelined? How many women of my daughter's generation were sidelined? And how many women and men are sidelined today because they can't get decent care for their kids. And how many kids weren't ready for kindergarten? How many were parked in front of television sets for hours on end because it was the cheapest way to take care of them? All because we wouldn't invest in our kids. So it comes to us, and we can make the change big change in this country. Change for ourselves, change for our children. Yeah, we need universal child care. <laughs> and more. We need to cut the student loan debt burden. We need 21st century infrastructure. We need real, real resources, not photo ops, real resources to fight opioid addiction. We need a Green New Deal to fight climate change. And we need to protect our children from gun violence. But most of all, we need to get in the fight and make our government work for the people. This is it, New Hampshire. This is our moment in history. This is the moment we are called to. This is our moment to dream big, to fight hard, and to win. Thank you all. Thank you.